Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SnapCon 2022! Woo! So delighted to be here. So delighted to also kick this off. This is, I think, our third SnapCon, and we've done some snapshots. It's a wonderful community. When SnapCon starts, this is a program we're going to run. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all from all around the world. In fact, all around the world, how about typing what country you're chiming in from in the chat? That would be really fun. And if you're, if you're in a big country, you can even put the state there. So let us all know in the chat where you're from. What a delightful way to, to connect with everybody. What we're going to do now in this very brief introduction, I want to get, get out of the way as fast as possible to be able to introduce the keynote. We're going to talk about the program. We're going to thank some folks who made this possible, talk about some of the Zoom norms, mention the forum, and introduce the keynote. So, for the first time ever in SnapCon conference history, we are coming to you online, as you all know, you're all on Zoom, but also from two face-to-face -face pods. Woo! There are four folks in the Berkeley room. We hope to have a couple of more in the next couple of days. How many do you have in the Heidelberg room? Lovely. Too many to count, and there's actually like about 20, I think. 20. <laughs> Delightful. So we are trying this as a new experiment. Obviously, it produces some AV issues, but we're seeing if we can have our cake and eat it too. The idea of a virtual platform makes this really cheap. Anybody can join from all around the world. It's just a wonderful space, and we may have this as the model going forward. But there's also benefit to seeing each other and connecting and hugging and doing a hackathon and, 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 see, and, and really connecting face to face. So we tried this. This is our first attempt. Please bear with us. You're such a gentle, welcoming community. I'm sure you will. But we're trying to have a face to face pod in Berkeley and a face to face pod in Heidelberg. And for those who are able to make it there, welcome. It's good to see you all face to face. It's wonderful. All right. Here is the program. It's a very similar program to the program you've seen before uh, in terms of having a four-day Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday program. Every morning starts with workshops, as you'll see. Then usually the next hour, then there's a 15-minute break. The next hour are some wonderful keynotes. Then there's a 30-minute food break for those who are having dinner or lunch or breakfast, depending on what time zone you're in. We're going to have a plenary. Whenever you see this all throughout all four rooms, it's a plenary. Come to the same place. Come to one room. Uh, and that link will be available in the snapcon.org site. Um, you see some, so for the first time here, some workshops are in there, are four parallel workshops. Then there's some talks, birds of a feather sessions. And then the third session or the fourth session is going to be panels, workshops, and some talks. And then we have a break. And then there's a social event. And if you're face to face, we encourage all the face-to-face -face folks in the pods to be part of the online social event. It's where everybody comes together and connects in Oye. And you'll see the link in the schedule. And then for the face-to-face -face pods, if you want to be social before or after, you might be having some tours and all kinds of things. So it's a wonderful time to do that. But do that outside of what you're seeing here on the screen. I do want to show you this. This shows you that we have some show your project opportunities that are going to be on Sunday, and there's still a chance for you to submit a project to be shown to everyone. And this is a plenary session. So please click on the button, submit your show your project. It's about a three minute ish demo of your project. It isn't necessarily about how it works. It's kind of what you did, what the spirit behind is. We'd love to see more wonderful projects. These have been wonderful in the past. Also next, I want to point you out that we have birds of a feather sessions. And we have three open slots. So if you're really passionate about gathering the community in some interesting way, um, this is an opportunity for you to propose a Birds of a Feather session. And some of the SnapCon organizers can put it on the calendar, and we'll make a space for you in the two rooms that are available. We also, oops, we also have a hallway track, which is always available in OEA. We're trying OEA again. And that'll be a place where you can connect with others, just kind of like a general hallway. So today's Thursday. What we're looking at today, we all had, I, I checked in, there were four wonderful workshops going on online that were great. Thank you so much for the workshop presenters and those who attended. Then we've got a break. Now we're right here where I'm introducing the keynote. Then there's a half an hour break. Then there's going to be lightning talks in the plenary room, 15-minute break. And then there are four, three different parallel sessions, one 
uh, panels and then some, some a talk, a panel panel, and then a workshop as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Delightful, delightful. Then the social time. So we'll be able to connect when we get to that stage. This is the organizing committee, uh, which is a wonderful group of folks that we've been working together with to make this possible. It takes a, it takes a village, if you, if you can imagine, to make this all work and to connect and to adjust the schedule and to do the submissions and the announcements and run the pod. So again, thank you everybody on the organizing committee for making this happen. It's a delight being part of this team and we invite others to join us. This is, you know, we, we can't keep doing this every year unless we have new blood coming in and all the folks can rotate off. So please think about joining us in the organizing committee. And if you're interested, let anybody on the organizing committee know. And I'm sure you know at least one person in this organizing committee. And then you can let us know if you're interested in helping with it. Wonderful. Whoop, bloop. I also want to thank all of the volunteers. This is a wonderful group of folks. All uh, UC Berkeley students or connected students in the Bay Area who have helped out and they're helping out both physically in the rooms, making sure the rooms are set up in different projections, projectors and all that, as well as being your Zoom hosts. So for all the sessions, like the workshops and the panels and the talks, the, the non-plenary sessions, these folks are going to be um, there as the Zoom host to make you co-host, to be able to support you in the Q&A any way you need them. It's amazing to be able to have a delightful uh, group of students all helping us with this. And I also want to thank the sponsors for making this possible. Thank you, Berkeley, for hosting this. Thank you, SAP, for hosting it, for hosting it as well, as well as supporting many folks who are on the SNAP development team. I want to, want to thank everybody who's made this possible, as well as those, those who have contributed money for tickets. People have volunteered and contributed money for tickets. Thank you again for all that support to make this possible. So, almost done. When we're in Zoom rooms, all sessions are being recorded and will be available afterwards. Again, I, I mentioned our volunteers will serve as the host and make all the speakers the co-hosts. It's up to you to decide as a participant whether to have your video on or off. And each presenter will decide how to handle questions. Do you want them to raise their hand? Do you want them just to shout out? Or just type the questions in the chat? Any, it's up to the presenters. It's very open, open space. Uh, we're not heavy handed with any, the way we run these sessions. We have a wonderful SnapCon, uh, sorry, Snap website, snap.berkeley.edu, and when you click in this top center, there's a forum. And if you click on that, you get to all of the forum topics. And one of the forum topics is the SnapCon 2022 conference. And that's a place to ask questions and contribute and kind of to continue the conversation after the conference ends, as well as start the conversation while we're all doing it. So it's a delightful space to be there. All right. So for the next four days, everybody, repeat until SnapCon ends, learn from each other, share your thoughts, share your projects, add to the community, meet new people, and have fun. We look forward to connecting with the next four days together. And it gives me great pleasure to get out of the way of the stage and introduce my good friend and working colleague, Jens Munnig. Jens is, as everyone knows Jens, who doesn't know Jens is part of this team? Um, Jens, you need a new picture, by the way, all this wonderful, all this wonderful health you've been doing. Um, what's cooking in SNAP is his topic. Jens has been such, such an anchor to this community, such an anchor, such a gentle, giving person who has supported all the feature requests and work with them and work with the team. He supported young students. He supported people learning how to program in SNAP. He's made this, those, the code open source. It's such a delight to, to consider Jens my friend and consider Jens a working colleague. It's wonderful, wonderful. I cannot wait to see what's happening in SNAP 8.0. And without further ado, let's give a hand for Jens. Woo! Self. And some issues. So uh, can you just again acknowledge that you're hearing me? <laughs> yep. And you can, yep. you can hear me. That's okay. great. Well, That's great. thank you so much. This is scary. We're here in tropical Heidelberg. Uh, there's basically all of Europe represented here. There is Ireland here. There is people from the Netherlands here, even from Austria. This is absolutely crazy. Um, and of course, some Germans. Uh, so I'm here to uh, talk about what's cooking in SNAP. I was not 
going to give a keynote. I said I was just going to give a short demo. And so I've prepared a bunch of slides, but nothing else is working. So let me just try to share my screen and you should just, just show you some of the things. Um, share my desktop. Uh, so let me see. Can you, can you all see my desktop? Yes, you can see it. Okay, so folks, what is cooking in Snap? Um, actually, Brian and I have incessantly worked on this for the past months and weeks, kind of in this very strange fashion where, you know, I stopped working when Brian started to work. And then we met at Brian's midnight my morning. And then we kind of had our meeting and we worked again. So what has, what's been cooking? Well, um, Snap version eight has cooked. Excuse me, yes? Yep. So Okay, uh, yeah, black screen. Snap version eight has cooked. And for the honor of the occasion, I kind of went to my wardrobe and got out, you know, an old piece of garment that I haven't worn for a long time. And I'm actually gonna try to, to, um, to get this, uh, Jesus Christ. This has been like um, over a decade since I've had to wear one. But since you're all here, uh, I'm gonna dress occasion, um, to the occasion and bind this uh, tie because I've been thinking about funky things, how to introduce, yeah, yeah look, look at that, wow. Um, this is actually a white tie because as a former attorney, I was required to wear a white tie in court. And what this is about, it's Snap V8 is all about be more tie. Now, what does that mean? Okay, be more tie is basically a funky acronym too. Uh, Snap Aid lets you be more together, lets you be more interactive, and lets you be more expressive. That's kind of, you know, a funky acronym. I was going to say SLOP. Uh, again, I mean, several learners, one project. I thought Thai was way cooler. It's just also way shorter. Uh, so I'm actually going to be done uh, within the hour. And so these three themes, really, more together, more interactive, more expressive, has been what we've most of us have worked on uh, during the past months um, where we were getting V8 ready. And so I, I just want to kind of jump right in and give you a bunch of demos of what this actually means. Um, and uh, so uh, obviously kind of the, the first one being more together, this is all about modules. So in Snap 8, really we kind of fixed some longstanding bugs, but we also introduced some new features. So it used to be that you used to be able to share sprites. You could export a sprite and import it into another uh, project. You could also export a costume, you know, media and a sound and, and import that into another costume. And you could export libraries, but it already had some issues. So we thought like, what are meaningful units of sharing things that will allow kids and all of you to work together? And so we wanted to have some larger granularity. That was scenes that we did last year. But this year we wanted to go more into the detail and also let you share individual scripts and even individual custom blocks. So I'm just gonna show this to you right now. Oh wait, I need to scroll this way. Can we see this? Yeah, we can see this. This is a little picture. This is Snap 8. Uh, so here's a project that Yadka knows well. We've been working on it. I think I might've shown it. Uh, last year. So here's, there's a bunch of custom blocks in here, which you can see when you say export uh, blocks, a bunch of custom blocks that this relies on. So if I now uh, right click on this script, for example, I can make a script pick of this script and I can export this script. And if I export this script, this is new. What I'm getting is, you know, I'm, I'm getting this export in, X, in XML down here. And now I'm just gonna open, oh wait, there's stuff floating around here that I can't get, Jesus, okay. I'm gonna open it in, a, in another snap. And um, so now if I get the receive message, message script in here and I, and, and I just drop it in here, it's placed in my hand and I can place it anywhere in here. And if you look at that, this has a bunch of custom blocks inside. And you actually are getting all uh, the exported blocks again that this script references. So you can now export libraries, scripts, blocks, 
without getting any of these undefined blocks that kind of leave you in the lurch. And this is, uh, we're hoping, makes it easier for kids to actually share stuff they're working on, uh, including dependencies. The another big thing has been smart images. And smart images is something that we're really, really excited about. So this is actually, we got to give credit to who invented this. This was, anybody know Brian Silverman? Brian Silverman, the author of Turtle Art. Turtle Art has this cool thing that, you know, you can make it to produce art, use blocks, but then the artwork itself, the file that is saved, which is, you know, an image file, actually has all the code in it. And, you know, one day we were asking Brian, like, how do you did that? And we were imagining that he did some kind of, you know, cool steganography using the least significant bits of the pixel data. And he told us, no, it's actually in the ping, the PNG spec, uh, it has metadata and you can just use it to save stuff in there. And luckily for me, there are some members in our community who are real programmers and actually know what they're doing. One of them is Darius Dorozalski, is Darius here? Yay, Darius, Darius is one of those people who actually know computer science and know computing and Darius figured it all out, how to read the spec and how to make it happen. And he collaborated with Jesus, one of Berkeley students, uh, one of Dan's students from Berkeley to make it happen. So I just basically took what they produced and integrated into Snap. So now we can do this. So um, let me just reload this project. It's an empty project again. So let's take another script. We're taking this when I am clicked script and I can make a script pick. A script pick, folks, is really the stuff that you want to do, that you want to use when you document something, when you share documentation. You don't want to do a screenshot. You don't want to do a script pick. So if you do a script pick, what you get here is, you know, a picture of the script. It's a, it's a ping. So let's again go to this other project and import this picture in here. And now folks, what happens is there are several ways where you can drop this. You can drop this either anywhere where there is a scripting area or you can drop it where there is not a scripting area. So what happens if you drop it onto the scripting area? It's a scripting pig. What happens is you get the script that is shown inside the picture and it could just use it right away. And it also, of course, has all the dependency, everything it needs to run. Uh, so uh, this is what we call smart images. You can also, and let me just import this again. If you um, drop it onto the stage or onto the corral, what you get is a costume because you might actually want to do something to the costume. So now my, my sprite is wearing that costume and I might want to do funky things with it, right? Um, but you can see, if you go to the costumes tab, you see this little icon here? Uh, it, it, it shows you, it indicates you that this is actually does have a payload. So you can say, right click on it, get the blocks. And if you get the blocks, it again switches and you get the blocks from uh, this ping. So basically what we did is, we want to make every picture of every script that is shared, you know, in BJC or in other online tutorials so, or on the forum to be shareable, that it also includes the code that it relies on. And see, since it includes the code and since Snap can translate that code, it doesn't matter which language you export this, the, the pic from. You will see the picture in the language that you choose to export it. But, you know, if you export it in Spanish and some kid in Korea uses that Spanish pick, it will still get the code and we'll be able to switch to Korean to see on that. So, so this is a way how we really want to foster uh, collaboration and sharing of things. And let me just show you one more thing. Um, so uh, there are also tools for you who work on kind of more serious notes that, you know, here's a little project um, that we've been using to, to do interesting stuff about the Titanic. Uh, so, for example, here is a little, like, it's got some data of the, of the Titanic inside. Uh, this is the passenger list of the, of the Titanic. And this is something that, that um, oh, oops, 
C happens to me, I need to enable JavaScript uh, extensions. So this is uh, a pie chart, for example, drawing the ratio of the survivors uh, versus, um, you know, the, the uh, casualties. So it's, you know, it's, it's drawn on the stage. So we can get the pen trails from it. Uh, these are the pen trails. I can, you know, add the pen trails to uh, my costumes. So now I'm adding the pen trails to my costumes. I click on this one, so I switch to the costumes tab. Here's the costume. So what I would like to do is I'm sharing this graph really that I've done. I want to include all the data that this was made from. Uh, so here is something that we have a new, like if you enable the extension blocks, this is where you get the extensions you can use you uh, to write, uh, the blocks you can use to write extensions. There is something that lets you actually work with costumes. So you can embed uh, data into a costume. So you want to get, you know, the uh, first item of my costumes now is this chart. I want to put this in here. And I want to put the Titanic data in there. Now it needs to be in a string format. So I need to first uh, say, you know, um, I want to get the uh, CSV of the Titanic. This is now a string. So I can place this in here. And now if I click on this once, see what happens. I'm now having this costume and it has a data tag in there. So now I can export this. I'm exporting this, it's called costume. Uh, where is it? It's in my downloads, it's called costume. I can say this is uh, Titanic age distri, whatever, distribution. And um, so this is really just a picture, but if I now go to another tab, let me just, let me just reload this, take a new one. Um, and get the Titanic picture in here, um, drop it in here. It doesn't have any blocks on it. So it's importing it as a costume, but you see data. And now if you right click on here, you can get the data. And what, what happens when you get the data is there's this new variable. It has the Titanic age distribution and it's a string. And if you wanna again have it, you know, as a, a CSV, you can split it by CSV. And now you've shared sort of a result uh, and the data that also lets your audience play with the data. So lots of possibilities for authors of extensions and of curriculum to share not just code, but you know, sprites, projects, and all kinds of data. Um, and the third thing is uh, we wanted to make it easier to work on the large scope. Like last year, we introduced scenes, but the way that you switch it between scenes and share data among scenes has proven to be a little bit difficult. So we tried to make that easier by letting, also letting you transmit data with every message. Let me just show this to you really quick. Um, let me just make a new project. So uh, I'm gonna, um, make a costume, I'm just gonna make the usual picture of myself. So here's a picture of myself. And what I now wanna do is I wanna switch to uh, the next scene. So I'm gonna make a new scene, make a new scene. Um, this is a new scene of scene two. And when something happens in the scene, like I wanna say, you know, when I receive, I'm making a new message. I'm saying, when I receive show, uh, I want to display something. I want to display some data that I'm getting. So I want to switch to a costume. And I actually want to send this costume. So I can now expand the slot, not just when it's anything, but I can send data with it. So all the data that I'm getting, I want to show as costume. So now I'm going back to my, to my first scene. And so I want to switch to the next scene and I can click on here and send some data. Now, what I want to send is actually my current costume. So here's my costume. 
here's my costume. And when I try to send this, I'm going to get an error because it requires me to send just data that can be uh, put into a CSV or to JSON. So what I'm gonna say is I'm just gonna send the pixels of my costume. This is now a table and I'm switching uh, this along and I'm sending the message show with the data pixels. So now what happens is I click on this, it's getting the data and it is rendering it as pixels. So I'm, I'm actually making a new copy of this. So this is kind of cool because it lets you build your own protocols. So of course, if I draw another thing like my usual example, I'm drawing a heart and I'm filling this. So now I have a heart here, but if I switch to the next scene and it gets the heart, see what happens is, yeah, it gets all the data, but there's some data missing. It tries to render it, but it doesn't know the dimensions of the costume. So what we can do is we can make another data structure here where we say, okay, let me just send a list whose first item is the costume, the, the, the pixel, the second item is the width, and the third item is the height. And now when I go back to here, uh, I can't just switch to the costume, but I need to kind of make a new costume. So I'm making a new costume. I could say, you know, make a new costume, uh, item one of data, uh, item two of data. We can make this easier. We could just say, make a new costume. We're just going to call this as a function. Call the new costume function with the input list here. So I'm going to try this. So now I'm also getting the sprite here. And let's try just one more time. So you really believe me that it's uh, working. Uh, I'm going to draw, yeah, something like this. Okay. So now I've got this clef. That's actually, yeah, totally works. So this, by the way, doesn't just work with scenes. It works with any broadcast. So you can now send and transmit data along with a symbol. You don't have to watch out for any message and then parse whether that message itself is a data structure. You can send the symbols, send a message, and include uh, data with it. Uh, so uh, it makes it much easier to kind of produce these kinds of protocols that you want for complex games and multi-level uh, projects. Okay, next thing is, so this was the togetherness, the modularity. The next thing is menus. We wanted to make Snap more interactive and it's kind of in retrospect, we were wondering like, how did we take so long? So usually what you see is tons of projects where you know, you're asking something, do you want to go to level one? Press one. Do you want to go to level two? Press, enter two. And you use the ask block for this. But we thought, what, like, you know, so we can, we can ask your name. And then when I say Jens, I can show the answer. But what happens if I say, okay, what if you, you know, the name is Ryan Yadga Michael or Lauren? I know there's just going to be four names. So what if I'm asking for a list? Now, if I'm asking for a list, what happens is we're popping up uh, a menu. And in this menu, you can select a name and I can select Yadga, and then the answer is Yadga. Um, and it's, it's kind of, uh, this really gets rid of all the things where you need to ask something and then kind of go through all the possibilities with the uppercase and lowercase. And so we made these menus really such that even if you resize them, they resize along. And there, um, there's kind of a 
funny semantic there. You can build very complex menus. You can put everything into a menu that is first class in Snap, including costumes, sprites, lists, and things. And there is a whole library that does that. Oh, actually, let me show you the, this library. So, so if you go to the libraries, there now is a menus library. And um, watch what Michael did. You can now see exactly kind of which, which custom categories and uh, which blocks are uh, in the library. So if you import the menu library, you get a bunch of new blocks in sensing. And there is one that says menu examples. And you can use this, you can basically use these blocks and use the menu examples. You edit it, you're, you're finding a bunch. You, you can say, you know, what's your name? You can prompt, choose something. And um, you, can, you can do this. You can also do uh, sub menus and, 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 and selectors and stuff like that. And also kind of, you know, ask, show something else in the menu than what is being reported. Like you, you want to say, you know, select north and it'll be, you know, zero um, and then south will be 180 or something like that. So plenty of things to do. We even made it so that you can use it to um, interact um, with uh, speech balloons. So you can have little kind of chat histories. If you might want to play back an interesting conversation you had with an AI and you want to kind of uh, start again at some point where the conversation maybe turned a little strange and say, okay, up, up to here it was okay. So you can say, okay, uh, this, is, this is where I want to resume the conversation. So more interactive menus, let the user make a choice from a list of options. We can use it if you don't have any options, you, you can just also pop open kind of you know, notification or a warning. Um, and it also lets you interact with chat protocols. The second, the uh, was kind of the I and the tie, and now we're coming to the to, to the to the kind of last feature, last big feature we added, and that is power box. And you know, I've been we, we get this asked a lot, like how does Snap, how is Snap different from you know Scratch or App Inventor? And I have to come up with a different answer every time I'm giving a talk. So here's my answer I'm giving you this time. And I, you know, maybe next time I'm going to give you something else. So uh, language-wise, you know, all those other languages have blocks, duh. But Snap has power blocks. Get this. So what's a power block? A power block fulfills our vision of no ceiling. Okay, hey, I'm really proud of this. What do you get when there's no ceiling? You get air. Ah, I got it. It's another action. So what does air stand for? Okay, I'm stretching this a bit, I guess. So air. So we have these blocks, you know, that have arrows <laughs> uh, in Snap. Variadic blocks. You don't find them anywhere else. We have blocks that extend the domain of input slots to also take lists. And our with input list block callback is a special form of that. Um, uh, so the, and we have blocks that have rings on them. So that's where air comes from. And we call these, you know, variadic blocks, hyper blocks. And I'm now calling the blocks that have rings on them meta blocks because we added some. And over the past year, we've really extended all three of these domains. What you're seeing here already is something that is already online. We published it in a minor release before. So we now have uh, more uh, variadic blocks. For example, like we have the, 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 the plus block and it's not just three plus four, but we can extend it and also say, you know, um, with as many slots as we want. And those are the kind of associative infix reporters. We can also use it um, you know, on the numbers from, if you put the, drag the numbers here onto the variadic input itself, it doesn't turn red, that's what people think, it turns the color of a list. So if you drop it here, the plus block turns into the sum block and you immediately get the aggregation of a list. And there are a bunch of other blocks like the minimum and maximum blocks and the, and the multiplication blocks. So power blocks part one are variadic blocks that have been extended. The second is hyperblocks. We hyperized, uh, kind of we extended the domain of some other function, 
some other functions that we have in SNAP, most notably of some of the special forms. So let me just give you one example. Um, and one that I'm particularly proud of, we, um, let me again make a picture of myself. Ha ha ha, never gets old. Uh, so usually what we show is kind of when you get the pixels of the current costume, uh, actually, I'm just gonna say the camera, uh, we're getting this giant table and now we can do kind of operations on this. But what if the operation that we want to do on it requires a conditional like an if or else? And that's when we usually kind of need a loop or you know, some map. There are some special cases where we can now use this directly in the if reporter. For example, we could say, you know, if those pixels are greater than, let's say 80. I want to make them 255. Otherwise, I want to make it into zero. So I could do this very quickly. So now most of it turns into 255. Actually, I don't know. Let's just, let's just look at this. So I'm going to switch to this costume. And what I'm getting is sort of a, an aha effect of uh, you know, kind of uh, Andy Warhol effect. And the cool thing is I can do this now since it's very fast. I can do this now also and the usual trick is, you know, I take the video snap on the stage uh, instead of the camera. And I want to do this all the time. Um, and now I basically have a camera that does this in real time. And I can go even farther and that's kind of the cool thing about using if this this way. I can also use a, a threshold like that. So I could say, you know, what's the distance to the mouse pointer? And say the distance to the mouse pointer is here where the threshold is the 80. So now as I'm moving and as I'm moving the mouse, I can sort of increase or decrease the threshold. And I kind of get this funky thing that basically uh, computes my live video down to just eight colors using hyperblocks. So we hyperized a bunch of other blocks also like the uh, and block and the or block. Uh, have fun with that. And the last thing that we added was meta blocks, more meta blocks. Now what are meta blocks? Meta blocks are blocks that access blocks and you used to see them. Um, we're using, you know, map and keep combine. We're also using loops that have C-shaped slots, which are just a special case of, of, of rings. And so we use them for control structures and for paths, for high order functions. But we also, since last year, use them to access the internals of blocks, like the definition of a block or the label of a block. And now in SNAP8, we can also change blocks and even make blocks that make blocks. Let me show this just very quickly to you. Um, so making a new project. So let me actually just very quickly make a block. Uh, it's gonna be the block foo. Uh, so here's my block foo. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna put anything in here. Here's, here's the block. And in the control category now at the very bottom, there is a bunch of new blocks. And I'm gonna, you know, you already know the definition of block. That used to be in sensing. Now it is in, it is in control. The definition of an empty block is empty, but there are more choices. You can get the label of a block. You can get the label of the block as foo. You can get the label of any block, the label of the if block here. You can already see there is something there. You see there's an if, and then there's two underscores. So input slots are represented by this as underscores. Um, you can also get um, other stuff. Like you can get the category. The category here is a number. That's just, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the category of the if block, for example, is, um, you know, five. Uh, what else can you get? You can get the, um, find out whether it's a global or custom. You can, you, you can find the type. That's whether it's a reporter. Um, you can get the slots. 
these are also kind of the slot types. So slots kind of have numbers. You can look it all up in the, in the, in the manual where it's all documented. But the new thing is that you can just, cannot just ask these blocks, you can also change them. So we can set the label of foo to be bar. And now look what happens. It actually changes the block in place. We now have self-modifying scripts. And uh, just, just before, it's, it's kind of scary. You can set the label to actually, um, let, me, let me try this. Oh, kids, don't do this at home. Um, uh, so this is the label of the block. Gosh, I can't believe I'm showing this to you. Okay, good. I'm joining the label of the blog. Um, actually, I'm going to rename it again to Foo because that's uh, funnier. Oh, look, I changed it both. So I'm going to join it like this. Um, ooh, look at that. Uh, oh, my God. What is going to happen now? I'm just going to make this 100 times. Uh, is this actually going to work? Okay, Jesus. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> We've got self-changing um, self scripts. So this is kind of a, a, a nerdy thing to do. But we can also actually do meaningful things with it. Um, <laughs> we can change, uh, you know, we can set the uh, category to another number. Uh, so we change its color. And uh, we can do the same thing, you know, we can say, you know, for i equals one to 10, set the category. Actually, it's going to run so fast that I'm going to have to make it slower, um, you know, a point four. And you can see it's cycling through all the colors. Um, so we can now, so now, okay, so now you can kind of knock yourselves out with uh, making kind of, you know, programmatically changing the way your, uh, uh, your scripts look. But, told you, we also now have blocks that make blocks. And that's kind of cool because uh, there are several new things that it lets us do. Um, one thing is kind of pedagogically, you know, sometimes kids, sometimes teachers like to actually see the block definitions without them being hidden in the block editor. We can now do that. But we can also do way other cool stuff. And I urge you all to come to Ryan's session, who's going to go into way more of this. So let me just show you how this could work. Um, so I can now, um, you know, define a block. And I could say, I'm going to define the block jump. And I'm going to say, uh, jump is going to have an input. So I'm, I'm adding this underscore. So since it has an input, this is where I put the definition. Um, I want to put you know, a formal parameter here. And now I can say, OK, uh, let's define the jump block. So I can say, repeat 10, um, change y by 10. And let's just duplicate this. I repeat 10, change y by. Oh, actually, it's not 10. It's repeat steps, right? Yeah, look at that. So now I've sort of defined it. I just want to make sure to also set the color. So now I can set the, you know, the category to the motion category. And I can set the shape of the input slot. I don't have to, don't have to do it, but I can set the shape of the input slot. If it's just, um, if it's just one, uh, it'll take, um, you can just type it in here. Otherwise, you need to type in a list of things. Two, you know, zero is just a regular thing and one is numeric. And I drag the block in here. So I'm changing the thing for every block. So now I'm going to go to the category and click on this. And I've actually just made myself a new block. Let's try this. Uh, I can take this and um, let's just uh, use it for 10. And it's, it's working. And if I open it, I can see the definition in there that they created for me. So this is how we can now also make custom blocks. And if I want to change it, like I uh, want to, you know, add another word, you know, uh, I want to say steps high. Um, it now uh, also uh, kind of makes a new block because now it has a kind of a new 
spec a new way and then it creates a new block and 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 um so there's also a block that lets you delete again blocks that that you know no, no longer need so uh look at that i can't believe i'm showing this to you uh, so i'm taking the delete block oh gosh kids this is so crazy look at what happens <laughs> it actually deletes the block. It's, it's magic. It deletes the block that's in the magic circle. Okay, so far so good. This was all great, and I thought I was done. Then Brian said, "But Jens, recursion. What do we do about recursion? It can't live with recursion. That's the big R." So, okay, God, let's do recursion. What do we do with recursion? I'm going to make a new block, and um, so I'm going to define the usual thing. I'm going to define a block that is the you know, underscore exclamation. And that is the factorial. It's taken n as an input. And so I'm doing the usual, you know, if um, n is one, you know, then return one. Otherwise, uh, say, you know, this is n, and now I need, now I've got a chicken and egg problem because I don't have the block yet. I can't drag it in. And so the idea that we came up with is that, well, we have this variable and it, it represents the block. So we call it. That seems kind of straightforward. So we call the block with the input um, n minus one. So let's actually try this. Also notice that uh, I'm, I'm just putting in here a reporter. I don't have to put in here a report block. If I'm just putting in a reporter, uh, what's going to happen is I'm just going to um, click on this. So now it's, it's, I didn't specify a category. So here's my factorial block. I'm going to put in five. It's getting me 120, so it works. Let's look inside of what happens. So inside, you notice that it auto-generated the report block for you, but you're also seeing that it doesn't quite look the same on the inside as I defined it. Here I'm putting in a variable that references the block, but in the definition, the way definitions are in, in Snap right now, they don't have an environment. Like it, it wouldn't know what block stands for. So we have this new special block that is this script. And this script is a special form that refers to the nearest ring, the nearest function scope that this is in. So uh, you'll also find this in here. So if I click on this script, I'm getting this script. You know, if I'm getting a list of, um, you know, the script and the script, look at this, this is kind of fun. Uh, you just think of that. So uh, there's kind of fun stuff you can do with this script. You can, you can basically capture the current environment that um, this is running on. So what we're doing here is we're doing a subtle compilation of blocks into blocks to make this happen. Uh, there are some more subtleties that you'll find when you play with this. For example, I can uh, just encourage you to read the brand new manual that uh, Brian has worked on all through last night. There is a fun little example in there that is even more mind blowing, where Brian shows you how we can make the blockify block, a block that takes data um, and generates a new block that makes that data. And you'll see some more subtleties with this script thing. So meta blocks, what is really our motivation? The motivation is partially to do stuff like this, but it is also to do some other things. Like we've been discussing this uh, also with Eckhart Modo from Göttingen, who has done a lot of um, teaching and has a lot of experience in Lower Saxony of students doing the Abitur. And there are a bunch of exam questions where students have to make abstract data types. And so what they give them is, you know, a name and a list of fields. And basically, they have to write all the accessors. They have to make a, you know, a new generator that generates a new uh, instance of that data type, and then all the accessors of the different fields. And you think about this. This is really something that we can now automate. So let me show you how to. Here's a little script that um, is kind of the, the 
least viable form of an abstract data type. So we're just defining a constructor. We give it a name and a bunch of fields. Uh, we make a constructor and you know, for every field, we make a setter and a getter. And you know what? This is a script pig. So you can see where this is going to, okay? So I'm just going to um, import this into Snap. Um, and um, so now since uh, this was a custom block, here is the custom block. Uh, here it is. Let me just uh, open this so you, you can see this. This was all inside inside the costume that I implemented. So now I can make, actually, I'm going to leave this open. I can make an abstract data type of, for example, a person. And I can say this should be you know, a name. I can extend this. I can say, OK, this is a, a first name. Uh, this should have an age, a person, and maybe an address. You get the idea. And so now what this does is when I click on this, it generates blocks that operate on this data structure. So here's this new person um, is actually this. It returns just a list with a new person. So if I make a new person uh, that is who's named uh, Brian. Oh, wait, no, I have to see, say Harvey. Uh, Brian, actually, let's not... Um, some age let's 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 be very private <laughs> okay uh basically what i'm getting is just a, a string but now i'm i'm also having uh, the all the the other accessories so i can say first name of this person is brian and this is all auto generated i can make another adt with other fields and thereby just um you know add these blocks so expect this feature to be used in future libraries uh, that we do, you know, where we need to generate things on the fly. Do you have to learn it? No, you don't. But it's a cool feature that library builders and, you know, advanced programmers are going to totally exploit for future uh, references. So this is about meta blocks. And there is so much more in version 8. I've just barely scratched the surface. For example, Brian has worked with Megan, and Megan has drawn these wonderful costumes that are now in, in, in the costumes library from her webcomic. And so uh, check him out. Uh, there's all kinds of poses and postures. Uh, there's more extensions. Uh, SciSnap from Eckhart Modo has a whole new version giving you mind-blowing capabilities of graphing data, of machine learning, of uh, doing all kinds of stuff that, you know, boggle my mind. There's the MQTT library uh, from Simon and Xavier, and there is a brand new super awesome ToonScope uh, library that probably all of you who've just been to Glenn's and, and Joe's workshop have used. Uh, many things as usual, this isn't just Brian and me. This is many, many folks have really worked hard and contributed to this. Michael uh, has really worked on the libraries again and on the kind of library preview thing and, 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 and on the design. Yatka has worked on, on curriculum stuff. Bernat has contributed. And uh, there's, you know, Jesus and the Berkeley students working on autograders. Oh, by the way, autograde, this is also where we need these meta stuff for, so we can read these things. Many, many folks have contributed, Darius, I've, 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 you know, many people from the community. So this is really kind of not just the tie that I'm wearing for all the audience, but for our collaborators, this is to honor all of you. It's been a pleasure. It's been so great to work with you on this together. Um, and um, uh, yay to Snap V8, enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Thank you so much, and thank you so much. I'm looking to the what? What? I cannot wait to try all these features out. This is just an amazing, amazing suite to tie it all together and to 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 connect it. The potential is unbelievable. This Snap Eight goes as far as to go even farther than Snap Seven, which blows my mind because Snap Seven did all these things that I would never have imagined. What an exciting update! This is so delightful. Um, I'm looking at my SNAP collaborators. Do we have time for questions or should we kind of go into the break to go back to being on time? What, what should we think? We're five minutes over. Michael, yes, says, Michael says two or three questions. All right. 
I'll, I'll try to field them if someone wants to raise their hand or just speak out. We're kind of casual yeah, here. Yeah. What questions do we have? And this was released yesterday, is that right, Jens? Feel free to ask any questions. I'm looking at the chat. All right, I, I've got a question. So not every recursion is always to the most immediate scope. So you, is it limited to only recurring to the most immediate function like that? We can't hear you, Jens. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you mute it yourself? Oh, I have to. No, 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 no. no, no, no. You have to go through this, right? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay, Ken, I was not showing you the more complicated example because of time constraints, but there is one in the new manual. Check the chapter on uh, metaprogramming. There is a, uh, the example of the um, Blockify block, which uh, captures an outer scope. And basically, we do this by doing some uh, compilation where we know that there's an outer scope, so we capture it and then we reference it from the inner scope. So, yes, you can have stack scopes. <laughs> by the way, this was uh, Brian, uh, who, of course, immediately uh, knew this. So, when I, I thought I was done when I had this, you know, script. Uh, uh, this script uh, reporter, and I thought, yeah, wow, I can do recursion. This is great. Everyone said, well, what if we have indirect uh, recursion? And then we figured out kind of how to work around this. All right, another question? Ayuk has a question yeah. here. Okay. Make sure I talk. Uh, yeah. Here? Yeah, 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 just, just go ahead. You're... Well, my, my question is um, the great people of the MIT, they built Scratch. Um, 15 years ago right now, and thanks to them, we have SNAP, uh, because uh, they wanted, they, they didn't want to make it too complicated for kids. And you wanted some, Ryan wanted some extra stuff to do computer science with uh, scratch-like things. Um, so you introduced extra features. Um, I think, that, that, was, that was great, and, 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 and you're still doing great, and I'm totally blown away by what you showed today, but where will you stop? <laughs> great question. <laughs> uh, great question, you. Where are we going to stop? Like, um, and you know what? Uh, you know, we can laugh about it, but I've been asking myself this. For, you know, in a way, for me, this is kind of moving maybe one step beyond my own comfort zone. I right. say, so, you know, now we have these scripts that can self-modify, like, is there any, like, now we're even taking the certainty out of, because we also, you know, out of what things mean, because they can change their meaning, we can overload blocks. We've even, like, what I didn't show yet, but read it up in the manual, there's another chapter um, on macros, on list by macros, which we now have. So we can now also run a block in the scope of another block. And so this is, of course, something that you can do all this kind of really hackery. You can actually inject code into another closure to actually modify it. And, but you know, it's been one of our guiding principles. And of course, Brian's formulated in, in, in his way that, you know, we're not here to teach about how to do things such that a big company with, you know, I don't know what Brian says, you know, 500 mediocre programmers uh, uh, doesn't run into issues of them stepping on each other's toes, but we're here to empower learners to do things. And I was pretty blown away when Brian referenced me to the chapters in his book, Computer Style, uh, or Computer Science Logo Style, that actually has a bunch of really, really awesome, very handsome and very concrete examples uh, that use these features that are really just plain fun. So where do we stop? Uh, Brian and I have discussed this. I think we're pretty much done feature-wise, but there's, you know, there's always stuff to keep up with. Um, and 
you're right that, you know, Scratch wasn't written to support computer science. And maybe that's part of the problem. We're having all these discussions about, you know, where people say, oh, but we have to use Scratch. And then others say, but this is the worst thing that happens because it didn't, it, it doesn't support it. I've never heard Mitch or Karen claim that Scratch is the right tool for teaching computer science. It's what everybody else has made out of it. So for them, it's about, you know, computational fluency. It's about sharing. And for that, it's great. Uh, so yeah, of course you can use it as a ramp up, but if you want to, you know, teach computer science, you snap because there's so much more. Wonderful. Well, thanks. Let's thank Jens again for his wonderful keynote. Woo! Outstanding.